All right. Um, this helps. I do this. There we go. I like Calvin and Hobbes. I read Calvin and Hobbes when I was really young. I actually attribute this largely to why I'm a philosopher. I found a lot of what he was doing in these comics fascinating. Here's one. Um, what is the joke? What's supposed to be funny about this? So in the first frame, he says, want to see something weird. Second, he says, watch. You put bread in the slot, you push down the le lever. Then in a few moments, toast pops up. And then Hobbes says, wow, where does the bread go? And Calvin says, beats me. Isn't that weird? What's so funny about that? What's the joke supposed to be? Yeah. And the bread disappears and the, to the toaster creates toast. Yeah, so it, what, it, what it's almost giving the impression is like what? The toaster like annihilates the bread and then it creates a new toast, a completely different object that it produces. Why, I mean, so this is kind of ridiculous, of course, but why might somebody make that mistake? Is bread like, is bread the same as toast or is it kind of different? It's a little different. This idea, believe it or not, is the idea Descartes is pressing at the end of the second meditation. At the end of the second meditation, he gives us this example of the wax. Um, let's take a look at this on page 45. And the purpose of this example is to try to show us that knowledge of what is within oneself is more certain than knowledge of what he calls corporeal things or material things, physical objects. If you remember, the way that we got to where we are now is that Descartes started his meditations with these concerns that our true beliefs are intermixed with false beliefs, and we can't tell the two apart, at least initially on reflection, that you just grow up picking up certain beliefs, and as you get older, you can't, you just come to accept them as all true, but they can't all be true. So he then said, let's doubt everything that can be doubted. Let's start over. So he invokes the dream argument, the evil demon argument, to get us to doubt everything and start afresh. Then in the second meditation, he comes upon the belief, I am, I exist. This is a different kind of belief. This is one that has to be true because whenever you think it, it, it must be true. There's no way it could be false. Even if an evil genius is tricking you and manipulating your mind, it has to be the case that I am, I exist, is true. So, um, um, from there, he goes on to this thought, this wax thing. So what he says at the start of the wax on page 45, this is on the right-hand side, um, in the top right paragraph, which I'm not going to read, what he essentially says there is that even though I've done all this meditating so far, where I can tell myself um, the only things I ought to affirm are uh, those things that I know to be certain, those things that have to be true whenever I believe them, like I am, I exist, I still find myself slipping into believing things that are less than certain, like there's a cup for me, I would say there's a cup on the table, or that there are other people in the room. So he says, what if we explore this idea? Instead of trying to doubt it, why don't we find out, is knowledge of things like there's a cup on the table, or there are other people in the room, is that knowledge dependent upon um, the senses, or do they have another foundation? Because you might think, well, those, those beliefs, at least, I get through the senses. Descartes is going to try to show through this example of the wax, no. You think that the senses are playing the central role in that knowledge, but they're not. Let's see if we can figure this out. So far, so good. Any questions about the setup to where we got here? I just really quickly ran through parts of what we've done here. So what he says on pages 45 and 46 is he says, let's take this piece of wax. Let me examine it on the cool side of the room, and then let me examine it on the hot side of the room, over by the stove or the fireplace. 
When, he's on, when you take the ball of wax and you look at it on the cool side of the room, he enumerates all these different things that we would say about it, and you'll notice he, does, he enumerates all five senses, and I've tried to bring that out. The way it tastes, the way it smells, the way it looks, the way it feels, and the way it sounds. According to your five senses, this is what wax is when it's cold. It is something that tastes, this particular piece, that it tastes sweet, smells like flowers, it looks white and round, it feels cold and hard, and if you thump it, it makes a noise when struck. But as you carry that piece of wax over to the hot side of the room and inspect it again, you get a completely different set of qualities about it. The way it tastes is different, the way it smells is different, the way it looks is different, the way it feels, and the way it sounds are all different. Now, if your senses are the things that tell you what is wax, how is that possible? Because what wax is, according to your senses, is contradictory. It's one thing when it's cold, and it's a completely different thing when it's hot. But everybody knows that just because you carry a piece of wax from one side of the room to the other doesn't mean that it ceases to be wax anymore. We all know that it's still the same thing. How is that possible? He says the only way that this is possible is if the way that we know what wax is is not dependent on the senses. If it depended on our sensory experience, then you would be forced to say that the wax when it's cold is one thing and the wax when it's hot is a different kind of thing. And since that isn't what we ordinarily judge, that we are fine saying it's still wax, it must be the case then that the way in which we make judgments about what wax is does not rely on our five senses. Um, this is one way to put this, is that our knowledge of what the wax is in itself not, and th this is the distinction, the way that wax is in itself compared to the way wax appears to be. Descartes is making a distinction that appearances are different from reality. Wax can appear one way, but what it truly is by its essential nature is something different. Our knowledge of what wax is in itself must not be through the senses, since our senses give us different descriptions of the nature of the wax. And this is a key quote here on page 46. He says, Thus, what I thought I had seen with my eyes, I actually grasped solely with the faculty of judgment which is in my mind. What's going on when you believe that there is a material object around, whether it's a cup on a table or another person sitting next to you or whatever it is, that belief is actually a judgment about the way about those appearances. It's different from the appearances. What you're saying is that these appearances are held or possessed by something that has those appearances that the appearances are not the same thing as um, the thing itself. Um, wax is not the same thing as just being hard and round and white and having a floral smell and a sweet taste and so on. That the wax is distinct from those qualities. It's a different kind of thing altogether. Um, it's the thing. What is the wax? It's that thing that has the qualities. And for that reason, the qualities can change, but it's still the same piece of wax. If the wax was nothing more than those qualities, then when you change the qualities, you no longer have wax anymore. It's a completely different thing. We're gonna, what he's getting at is something, and I say this I think on the next slide, that we're going to uh, explore more when we talk about it in Meditation 5. So one of the things he's getting, so what is this thing that we know? How does the mind tell us what it is? Well, the key here is that this is a form of innate knowledge. He's trying to show that even in ordinary judgments about cups on tables, people sitting next to you, chairs behind desks, those beliefs are invoking kind of almost 
in a way you weren't fully aware of until this moment, he would say, but a kind of judgment that involved an innate idea, an idea that was already in your mind, um, but you weren't aware of, of exactly what that was. We have innate knowledge about the essences of things. And this is the, the, the bit that will take us back to, med that we'll pick up on Meditation 5. We believe that the true nature of things are not the same as their appearances or those surface level qualities that we pick up on. And he wants to point out the role of judgment in these beliefs. So we do not perceive physical objects directly. We judge that they exist based on appearances. And one of the, the ideas he closes this chapter with is similar, which is that you don't believe, you don't have a direct perception of people. You don't see another person. Look around the room. Descartes would say, what you, when you look around the room, you don't see people. What do you see? You see bodies. You see skin and hair and clothing. You hear auditory sounds like speaking. But you don't perceive persons. A person, as Descartes is going to argue later, is different from their body. How do you know, another way to put this is, you don't perceive conscious, other people's consciousness, do you? All, how do you know that there's a, pers there's a conscious being sitting next to you? Sometimes when I'm up here teaching, I wonder, how do I know any of y'all are conscious? Um, one, you know, you could say, well, the behaviors and all these sorts of things, but that's the key, is that you're inferring that there are conscious creatures in this room. But you don't directly perceive con other conscious creatures. Well, Descartes is kind of saying that about no, that same idea is going on with physical objects. You don't directly perceive physical objects. What you perceive are the appearances of these objects in your mind, and then you judge there must be some kind of physical object that is causing me to have these appearances. And so, um, all of those judgments rely on this innate knowledge where we have within us um, sort of a, an innate notion about the essence of these kinds of things we perceive. Any questions about how Meditation 2 is ending? So the, here's the summary. This is what we've done in Meditation 2. This takes us back to the end of uh, last week's class. So we started out with this thing that I called... That, scholars called the cogito, the I think, therefore I am. Um, this is a revolutionary discovery for Descartes because this gives us certainty, that foundation for all future knowledge. So after the first meditation leveled all the knowledge we had and erased everything, this is our starting point. Our starting point in the sense that it is the kind of belief that is impervious to doubt, that is absolutely certain. And from here, he thinks, now we are in a position to find more of those kinds of beliefs. Um, the cogito also illustrates another key thing for Descartes, which is the essence of this I. When he says, I exist, or I am, he doesn't want you to think of the way that we sometimes think of ourselves, like having a body, or having, you know, a certain, like dressing a certain way, or living at a certain location. But when he says, I exist, what you should think of is that something is, whatever it is, is required for my conscious thoughts. Whatever is required to think, when I hold my thoughts, that thing must exist. And then finally, we get the example of the wax, which demonstrates innate ideas and the role of judgment. That's the second meditation in a very, very quick nutshell. Any questions about the way this is playing out. So this takes us to the third meditation. This is sort of, uh, you know, I think of Descartes here. I feel like he's smiling with his eyes. I don't know. But I kind of like this picture of him. Um, the third meditation is arguably the most difficult and the, the most challenging of all the six meditations. Um, this is what he's setting out to do here. 
He wants to establish the existence of God in order to secure what he calls clear and distinct reasoning um, with regard to general or universal ideas. Clear and distinct reasoning is just what we talked about with the I am, I exist belief. It's the kind of belief that when you hold it, has to be true. It's the kind of belief that when you, you carry the thought, there's no way it could be false. So, what he's worried about in this meditation is how do I know that's always going to be true? How do I know that all clear and distinct thoughts are going to turn out to be true, and not just the few that I've entertained so far? Um, he says that if we can establish the existence of God, then that would guarantee that they're all true, because God would then be the author of my nature, God would be the one who's created my mind this way, and if he's created my mind this way, then we can trust our minds. We know that our minds haven't been put together by a deceiver. Um, how does he go about proving the existence of God? The key idea behind it is that uh, there is an infinite idea of God. Our notion of God, when you think about God, when you think about what is God, what kind of being is God, you should have the idea that God is an infinite being. And based on that, Concept, Descartes thinks he can establish that God really does exist. We'll see how that plays out. Um, let's take a look at the doubt that he's looking at here. It starts on 47 on the right column. And I'm going to read some of this. Um, so... <clears throat> So, the very bottom on 47. He says, but what about when I considered something very simple and easy in the, in the areas of arithmetic or geometry? For example, that 2 plus 3 make 5 and, and the like. Did I not intuit them at least clearly enough so as to affirm them as true? To be sure, I did decide later on that I must doubt these things. But that was only because it occurred to me that some god could perhaps have given me a nature such that I might be deceived even about matters that seem the most evident. So, and I'll pause there and say, so what he's saying there is just recapping that last part of the first meditation. Remember, after we had the dream argument, we had the, these other arguments. And the concern was, um, the dream argument only cast doubt on particular things, on beliefs about this particular water bottle, or this particular person, or this particular class going on. But it, you could always ask, especially in the dream argument, well, where did I get the concept of a cup, or the concept of a class, or the concept of a person? Where did I get those ideas? So there must be some reality to those ideas, those general ideas that inform my dreams, if I am dreaming. So the next level of doubt, if you recall, takes us to God. And God, he says, well, God could have created you such that you have these general concepts. And even worse, God could have created you so that you have these general concepts and you got them wrong. So that you think about these general ideas and then you get them mistaken. And if God's omnipotent, what's to stop him from doing that? Now we mentioned that God, well, here's one thing we could stop God, is that he's supposed to be all good. If he's all good, what's he doing deceiving me? So that led him to this materialist or evolutionary argument, but the ultimate expression of this was the evil genius or the evil demon argument. And in that one, what he's saying then is, what if there was an evil person with a lot of power who was controlling my mind? That's what we, where we're picking up here. These general universal ideas remain unknown to us. Um, but we're not certain about them until we can know for sure there is a God. So, skipping on that paragraph, still on 48, I'm skipping down a, like a large portion, so about eight lines from the bottom of that paragraph. Um, he says, the basis for doubting, this kind of doubt about universal general concepts, depending as it does merely on the above hypothesis, is very tenuous and, so to speak, metaphysical. But in order to remove even this basis for doubt, I should at first, at the first opportunity, inquire whether there is a God, and if there is, whether or not he can be a deceiver. 
For if I am ignorant of this, it appears that I am never capable of being completely certain about anything else. All right, so here's what we're up to. The doubt that we're dealing with here, as I've, I've talked about, has to do with these general universal concepts, which would then apply to things like mathematics and general truths, like re all red things are colored things. The, uh, these ideas must come from some perfect source, Descartes thinks, in order to overcome this metaphysical doubt. So, um, so, we have to establish there is a God before we can be, before we can move forward and know anything else. Otherwise, the only thing, so if Descartes can't succeed here, this is what we're stuck knowing. All we could ever know are things like, I exist, and right now, I am thinking about this book. But you can never know that there is a book. You could never know anything more about yourself. It would just be you know, these very basic beliefs about I am thinking and then I am having these kinds of thoughts. So we need to have God in order to move beyond that. So in order to, to get us thinking about how he's going to establish the existence of God, he kind of goes on this little detour about how it is we could know that our ideas about the external world could correspond to reality. And he entertains a few of these different things. This is going to be helpful for understanding the sixth meditation, as well as his argument for God's existence. So here's one argument you could put forward, that the ideas that you are entertaining right now occur to you without you willing them to occur. So right now, um, maybe, you know, you might think it would be better right now for you to be experiencing a beach in Hawaii than sitting in Pennsylvania while it's still snowing, right? You say, why, why do I have the belief that I'm in snowy Pennsylvania right now? Well, because you, it's occurring to you against your will. You're not in control of it. If you're not in control of those beliefs, it implies then that they are coming to you from some other source, from some other means which might then mean that there is a reality that exists that is independent of your will, and that that reality is the cause of your thoughts about it. But, Descartes says this isn't going to work, because how can I be sure there isn't some other faculty, one not yet sufficiently known to me, which produces these ideas? You could think about how, like in Freudian psychology, there are parts of your mind that are unknown to yourself. There's like a subconscious that is doing things to you. Um, Descartes says, how do I know there's not another part of my mind that is tricking me or that produces false ideas within my mind? I can't know that. So the fact that I'm having these thoughts against my own will doesn't mean that there must be a world that they correspond to. And even if they did, even if they were produced by an external world, we have this other problem, which is it doesn't follow that the things that, that are being produced in my mind resemble the way the world is. It could be the case that I'm having these ideas and they're produced by a world that's entirely different than the representations that are in my mind. So this won't work. Um... So here's another th attempt he makes. He suggests this, that because the degree of reality in those ideas requires some greater cause. Now this is a very strange thing for us to hear. We tend to think reality is a yes or no thing. It's either real or it's not. Not that some things have more reality or less reality to them. But in Descartes' metaphysics, and the metaphysics largely accepted at his time, this is actually a very, this is something they would talk, they would say, that there is more or less reality to things. To explain this part of the argument, and this is the part that's most directly related to God, or his God argument, we have to take a little metaphysical inter interlude and explain some terms. So there are two kinds of existence, things that exist. There are substances and there are modes. Sometimes today we say properties, qualities, features for modes. A substance is, well, it's really hard to define, but roughly we could just say it's any particular thing. 
So, um, my water bottle is a substance. Your book is a substance. Your body is a substance. The table is a substance. Um, <coughs> substances are just particular things. There are material substances, and then there are immaterial substances. An immaterial substance would be, according to Descartes, something like your mind or your soul. God would be an immaterial substance. If there are angels and demons, those would be immaterial substances. They are entities that are not made up of matter, but are nonetheless particular things. A mode is a way in which something exists. And like I said, we sometimes call these properties, qualities, or features. Now, there are properties, qualities, and features of material things, like their shape, size, and location. There are also properties or modes of immaterial substances. And so what would be a mode of your mind? Well, it would be like one of your feelings or ideas a judgment that you make, a, a choice that you make, the desires that you feel. So, like, a mode would be something you experience through your senses, right? It Can could be. That? It could be, yeah. So, like, <clears throat> the smell of a flower, right? The smell of a rose, that would be a mode in your mind. That, that sensation. All right. The sensation of, like, the smell of a rose is, a, is in your mind. as a mode. But your mind is the thing that has it. Okay. So just work with a material object first. So like this little controller. One of, it's a substance. One of its modes is, at least for the most part, being like black color. The blackness does not like black does not exist. Like blackness is not something that you could point to and say that's what it is. Blackness is a feature of a substance. Blackness only exists insofar as a substance possesses it. But this remote is different from just being blackness, because if I painted the remote white, it would still be the same remote. So this remote, one, the way in which this remote exists right now is in the black way, and by, uh, by exhibiting blackness, instantiating what is black. But the blackness is distinct from the remote itself. Yeah? Can you have an immaterial substance without a property? I think the answer... This is kind of an interesting question. The question of what subs... Like, the, the intelligibility of substance at all is going to be a question through the duration of the course. What I want to say in response is that most people think in that you cannot have substances without properties. Otherwise, it wouldn't. how would you pick it out, or how would you discover? Like, the way in which we know what substances are are through properties. If you take a substance <coughs> and you strip away all of its properties, this is an argument against substances, too, but is that what's left? Well, it seems like nothing. Um, we'll see. For an immaterial substance, um, this gets r trickier. Um, We'll see if we address any of these as we move forward. We can come back to this question either later as we move okay. forward or even later in the course. Okay. Yes, Zach? I'm just making sure I have this the right way mm -hmm. just so I don't get confused off the bat. The, <clears throat> the remote that you had, yep. it's a material substance, but its mode is the black, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so it's the mode has to do with the substance itself. Yeah, so modes are just the, once again, the qualities, the features yeah. of the substance. Okay, I was just making sure I had that. Another mode of this remote is that it's made of plastic. Yeah. Can a mode exist without a substance? No. No. Okay. That one, uh, once again, uh, unless we're going to see people, there are people later in the course we're going to study who deny the existence of substances. For now, let me try to convince you Descartes is right and work under the assumption that you don't just have, like, here, here's the, the thought. You don't just have these qualities just flying around loose and undetached from things. They seem to be, like, located in something. Now, there's something that ties all those properties together. And that thing that holds all the properties together is the remote. Now, if you talk to Brianna, she also is aware of other contemporary views on this. She was in my metaphysics class where 
we talked about things like the bundle theory and so on. They deny substances. And we're going to read Barclay and Hume later in the course, and they, at least Hume for sure, Barclay seems to be a, a bundle theorist. When we get to there, you'll know what I'm saying. Um, but the idea for now is that substances are sort of the things that hold the properties, but they are distinct from the properties. They're not identical to the properties they possess. Other questions about this? These metaphysical points I'm making are helpful not just for understanding Descartes, but many other things we're doing. So if this is not clear to you, um, which it may not be for a lot of people, um, this is a good time to try to get a little further in your understanding. We'll rock and roll from here. Um, a few more metaphysical distinctions. Descartes talks about objective reality and formal reality. Objective reality is the amount of reality that something has in virtue of it being a representation. So, what does that mean? So think of objective reality, not in the sense, sometimes when we say objective, we think of it as like detached from the mind or detached from a perspective. Do not think of it that way. Objective in this sense means like object of thought, like the, the object that you have in mind. So what he means by objective reality is just the reality something has insofar as you think about it the reality that your thoughts possess. Like if you think about, here's one way that you could get into Descartes' mindset. When you think about a pink elephant, there is something that you are thinking about. And that thing you are thinking about, therefore, must have some degree of reality to it. Otherwise, what, what, what are you thinking about? <laughs> the second kind of reality is what he calls formal reality. Formal reality is the kind of reality something has in virtue of the kind of thing it is. So in virtue of its own essence and of its own nature. So this would be the difference. When you think about an elephant, your thought has some degree of reality to it. But an elephant in and of itself, independent of your thoughts, like just... And the fact of there being an elephant has, a, has a, a degree of reality to it as well. And reality, or existence, comes in degrees. So here's the way that this works out. Modes have less existence than substances. Why? Because substances, sorry, because modes depend on substances for their existence. As we were kind of going through that, <coughs> that idea that Descartes has, a mode, does, a mode has, does not exist on its own. A mode exists because it is instantiated in a substance. For that reason, the substances have more reality to them than the modes, because substances have a kind of independent existence. And secondly, if one substance is greater than another, then it will have more existence than the other. And my, I don't know for sure how exactly this would play out, but maybe here's a thought. An elephant has more formal reality to it than a fly. Why? Because there's more stuff that makes up the elephant. The el there's more of the elephant. So if there's more elephant, then there's more reality. Maybe it's not, So that's one crude way to get it. Maybe what Descartes would say is more about the quality of something. So that the elephant... Here's maybe another thing that he might say. That, you're, that you, as a person, have more reality than an elephant. Why? Because you are a better qualitative thing that exists. You have, so you have reason. You have morality. You have uh, a rich plethora of emotions and sensations and ideas and thoughts. And that makes you have more reality to you than what an elephant is. Especially in Descartes' views, view of what an animal is. Another thing to keep in mind, because we're going to be talking about God in a minute, is that God, being infinite, 
has more reality in his being than anything else. So that that def whatever else we say about of comparison other substances, God is the trump card overall, no matter what. Because God has the most in terms of size by being infinite and the most in terms of quality in being absolutely perfect. So, questions about this distinction and then we resume where we are with Descartes here. Yeah? How can uh, one substance be greater than another? Either in terms of just mass. <laughs> and how big they are? Yeah. Or in terms of just qualitatively the kind of thing it is. So once again, human beings, we have m maybe there's something greater about our existence than the existence of rocks. Even a boulder that's five times my size, you might say that there's more reality, perhaps, to my existence than to that rock. Because I'm a, I have hopefully more nobility in my being than in it. That's what they're thinking. Yeah? But if um, you were to compare two people, one of them who was bigger in size, but the smaller one was had more intellect, which one would be greater? That's a good question. I suspect Descartes would value the aspects of intellect more. However, Descartes still might think that they're equal because they, maybe in Descartes' mind, they both have the same potential. And maybe that's all that he would say is necessary to say that they're equal. That just because one is, in fact, more intelligent than the other doesn't mean that the other one actually is superior in any way. So, if we bring this back to God, or before we do God, he wants to talk about reality again, or I want to tie this back around. Um, to make the argument work, we have to talk about this causal principle, which he brings up on page 49. This is the way Descartes puts it. There must be at least as much reality in the efficient and total cause as there is in the effect of that same cause. What does that mean? Here's a, here's a simple way to put it. Something cannot come from nothing. You can't get something from nothing. What he's getting at is that the effect can't have more in it than its cause. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're getting something for nothing. Um, another way in which Descartes intends this to be understood, and probably is a little more controversial, is this, that which is more perfect cannot come from what is less perfect. But he thinks something like this is, has to be right. In fact, he thinks this is something that is clear and distinct. It's, and when he thinks that when you really think about this, the truth of this particular claim is just as evident as the claim that I am, I exist, must be true. If you really think this thought, and you really carefully understand what it means, the truth of this statement has to be self-evident. It's the sort of thing that when you think it and you understand it, there should be a kind of, aha, of course that's true. There's no way that can be false. If this were, fal if this were false, then you could create something out of nothing, and that's impossible. So this is what I just said is illustrating what he calls the light of nature. It's a clear and distinct idea. You know that this is true. It is justified on the grounds that when you think about it, the truth of this idea is evident just by entertaining the thought. <clears throat> and here's the passage where he says this on 49. This is manifestly true not merely for those effects whose reality is actual or formal, but also for ideas in which only objective reality is considered. So here's where we're talking about cause and effect, not just of things that exist, what he calls actually or formally, those things that exist out in the world, but also when we consider things with regard to their objective reality, which is the reality that we have of things insofar as they are an object of thought. So, let's come back to the text. I want to make sure that I'm not getting too far away from what we're reading and show you how all this ties in now. This, after doing all that metaphysical parsing, <coughs> there is payoff, I hope.
Um, look on the bottom paragraph that spans page 50 there, um, the two columns. So he says, And the longer and more attentively I examine all these points, the more clearly and distinctly I know they are true. But what am I ultimately to conclude? If the objective reality of any of my ideas is found to be so great that I am certain that the same reality was not in me, either eminently or formally, and that therefore I myself cannot be the cause of the ideas, then it necessarily follows that I am not alone in the world, but that something else which is the cause of this idea also exists. But if no such idea is found in me, I will have no argument whatsoever to make me certain of the existence of anything other than myself. For I have conscientiously reviewed all these arguments, and so far I have been unable to find any other. So what he's trying to do here is this. He's asking himself, is there any thought that I possess that is, has so much reality in it that I have to conclude it's not something I created myself? Is there anything that I think about, any thought that I hold that has so much reality to it that I have to conclude, actually, something else must have caused it, other, because it's greater than something I could have created within my own being. So what he goes through next, if you kept reading here, so he talks about other men, animals, angels, corporeal things like physical objects, and God. Let me see if I can illustrate what he's doing here. You find yourself with the idea of a tree. So the thing that's in the thought bubble is the objective reality. When you think about a tree, when you have the idea of a, tree, of a tree, when you have just the thought of a tree, whether you're asleep or awake, you look at a tree, you get this in your mind. <clears throat> now Descartes asks, given the reality of this thought, what can I conclude caused me to have this thought? This thought is an effect. What is the cause of this idea? Could it be, so, if we start on the bottom left of the screen, could I be the cause of the thought? Could there be something within my own mind that is just generating these thoughts without me being aware of it? Could it be actually a tr something like the very thought itself, like a tree that is causing me to have this thought? Could it be a rock? You know, something, so what I put here was like another, something else that is out there in the world that doesn't even look like a tree. Could that be causing my idea of the tree? And then, our favorite character, the evil demon, could he be the one that's causing me to have this thought? Which one is it? Well, okay. Descartes is going to say when it comes to something like a tree, the answer is we don't know. It could be any of these things. Any of these things, for all we know, could be causing us to have this idea. Why? Because the amount of reality in the thought of a tree is so low that it, anything that is greater than the thought of the tree could cause you to have that idea. So, <clears throat> it could be you. It could be a tree. It could be another thing out there in the world that's not like a tree. Or it could be an evil demon or an evil genius doing it. But in any case, you can't rule any of these out. Why is the thought of something else that's not a tree possibly greater than the tree? Because it has, it is something that has, it's a substance, here's the answer. It's a substance with formal reality to it. This thing has, is a substance, this thing in your mind is a mode. It's just a mode of your thoughts. So it could, since substances have more reality to them than modes, the substance, the, some other substance could, for all we know, be causing you to have this. Why is that substance not a mode? If it's in, if that, if that could be causing your, that could be causing your thought. How is that other substance not also a mode? The reason is that this thing exists independent of your thoughts, whereas this thing in your mind only exists because you think it. So we're talking about just the thought, which is the mode, and those are all things that could have caused that mode. That's right. 
When you see this thing in the thought bubble, don't think a physical tree. Think your thought of a tree. All right. So it's like you're staring at a rock thinking about a tree. That's right. And if you want to take this more seriously, this option, one way to do that is to think, well, they're optical illusions, right? You've seen the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. He gets to that point where he gets to that thing and it looks like there's a chasm there. Um, it's not really a chasm, there's this bridge, but the bridge looks exactly like the background, right? So, it appears like um, something that is not... So, so you could imagine, what if there were a tree that was like set up, or, or sorry, a set of boulders that was set up just right, and you were in just the right angle, it could cause you to have the impression or the, the experience of a tree, even though it, you're not actually having one. It, or even though there's not actually a tree there, I mean. It's always possible stuff like that is happening. And if you're a really unfortunate person, your whole life could be made up of those things. <laughs> really unfortunate. So, at the end of the day, it comes down to God. God alone is the only thing we can use this argument for. And this takes us to the very top right of 51. And this is sort of the summary paragraph. He goes into this more detail throughout the meditation. Um, he says, and let me just read this short paragraph. Thus, there remains only the idea of God. I must consider whether there is anything in this idea that could not have originated from me. I understand by the name God a certain substance that is infinite, independent, supremely intelligent, and supremely powerful, and that created me along with everything else that exists. If anything else exists, indeed, all these are such that the more carefully I focus my attention on them, the less possible it seems they could have arisen from myself alone. Thus, from what has been said, I must concede that God necessarily exists. Very fast argument there. Let's see what he's saying. So now we need to think about God. Our idea of God, the now here's Descartes' language, the objective reality that makes up this thought is different than the objective reality that makes up your thought of a tree, or a rock, or even yourself. Why? Because your the the objective reality that makes up your thought of God is of an infinite substance, a an absolutely perfect being. And notice, uh, I use the little lazy eight there um, to illustrate infinity. That's really the key thing, is that your idea of God, he's going to say, no matter who you are, if you believe in God or if you're an atheist, if you think about it, what we all think of when we think of God is supposed to be of some infinite substance. Something that is supremely perfect in all ways. Well, where did we get this idea of supreme perfection or of an infinite substance? <coughs> Could I be the cause of that? No. Why? Because I am a finite thing and I am an imperfect thing. Since I am finite and imperfect, I couldn't have created this thought because remember that causal principle we saw a few slides back. You cannot get something from nothing. You cannot get something more perfect from that which is less perfect. So something which is finite and imperfect cannot be the cause of that which is perfect and infinite. Could it be some other finite object outside of me? No. Because of the same reasons. It is imperfect and finite. Could it be an evil demon causing me to have this idea? Wrong again. The only thing that could, Descartes argues, that could give me this idea of God would be God. It has to be something that is infinite and perfect. Otherwise, there would be no way for you to get the concept of infinity and perfection. It has to be God. And here's the cool thing if Descartes' right. That causal principle, like I said, was justified by being a clear and distinct idea. Likewise, Descartes thinks that, how do you know that this idea of God is, is correct? Or how do you know that you have this idea of God? 
because it's a clear and distinct idea. It is something that you know is correct because that when you reflect on it, you understand it must be true. The argument is basically this. Our causal principle goes first. No effect can, can, can contain more reality than its cause. No effect can contain more reality than its cause. So that's, one, whether in terms of like greatness of reality or perfection to imperfection, the idea is that no effect can, have, can contain more reality than its cause. And that is justified, like I said, by being a clear and distinct idea. An idea that when you think about it and understand it, you recognize it must be true. The second premise is just that my idea of God is that of an infinite substance, a supremely perfect being. How is that justified? It is justified by clear and distinct reasoning. Just by reflecting and entertaining that thought, it follows that it must be correct. Therefore, from those two claims, it does follow that there must be then some infinite, I could add in there, perfect, oh, I did get it there, an infinite substance that is supremely perfect. Otherwise, um, you would be, this idea would have been, uh, there's no explanation for the cause of the idea. The idea you possess needs to be explained, and the only possible explanation would be an infinite, perfect substance. Now, some people, you, your reaction to this is either disbelief or you're impressed. I don't know. Um, Descartes does consider objections to this approach. And that's what largely happens uh, in the last parts of this essay, uh, this meditation. So he considers other possible causes for this idea. So one of the ones he entertains on page 52 is the, the idea that I, that I might, have, I might have confused or come up with this idea of God because of my potential to be perfect. So basically, I based my idea of God on myself. It might sound kind of weird, but actually there's some attempts to explain away religion psychologically that actually follow these kinds of lines. Um, so could the potential to be perfect that is within myself be the basis for my idea of God? Descartes says no, because a potential being cannot create this idea. The fact that you have the potential to be perfect um, does not mean that you are actually perfect. So if you were actually perfect, yes, you could create this idea. But since we all know that we are not perfect, after all, you have potential. If you, if you, if you have potential to get better, guess what? You're not perfect. There's room to grow. So since you are a potential being, you cannot create this idea. It has to come from an actually perfect being. Could this idea have been caused by some less perfect being? So one of the things he entertains on page 53 is, what about my parents? Because a lot of you, if I were to ask, go around there and say, where did you get your idea of God? Some of you might say, my parents taught me. Descartes would say, your parents really didn't teach you what the idea of God is. Maybe they brought your attention to this idea, but they didn't introduce it because they're not capable of giving you this idea. This idea of something that is absolutely perfect and infinite would have to, be, would have to come from something that is absolutely perfect and infinite. So it's not able, your parents are not able to give you this idea because they are finite and imperfect. Um, <clears throat> could this idea have been cobbled together from several partial finite causes, you know, that we get this idea of God maybe from a several different sources. And Descartes will basically keep repeating the same thing. Um, all of that doesn't add up to infinity. Moreover, your idea of God, Descartes says, is one that has great simplicity and unity and inseparability about it. It's not that your, your idea of God is not like the idea of like these Greek mythological creatures that are like half lion, half eagle, half lizard, and so on. Your idea of God is more of a, a simple and coherent unity to it that is not cobbled together from a variety of different kinds of things. And so for that reason, he thinks, it's not the sort of belief that you could just put together um, from all these other partial finite causes. Mm -hmm. Uh, what would, is God the only thing that he thinks is perfect? Like, would he say anything else is? 
No, only God is truly and supremely perfect. So he says that we can create anything because everything else is less perfect than us. Explain that to me real fast. What are you thinking with that? Uh, well, if he's if he's the only thing that's more perfect than than us, then we could be able to create anything because nothing's more perfect than us. Although the, the key thing is that we're we are not perfect, right? So as long as we still have imperfections in us, um, we wouldn't be able to create anything greater than ourselves. Well, what, what would he consider greater than ourselves besides God? Well, that's an interesting question. Are some people think? I mean, so this is a, a little weird, but like angels might be greater than us. Something that's greater than humans, but less than God. Yeah. Um. As far as we, uh, that's so maybe uh, you're you're I think you're basically right then. So besides those things, <laughs> we can't create God. We can't create any of those other kinds of beings if there are any that are greater than us. We basically have the potential to create anything else. Yeah. Like, did he believe in like Jesus? Yeah, he was a Catholic. Well, he was Catholic, but so Jesus came from Mary, who was thought to be perfect too, but she came from imperfect parents. So how would that work if we can't make something perfect if we're imperfect? I would argue, well, this is what I would say. Talk to your religion professor. <laughs> um, that's, a tough, that's a tough issue to resolve in, in anybody's metaphysics, not let alone Descartes. Um, usually the, the solution is something roughly like this, that we distinguish between Christ's human nature and his divine nature. Christ's divine nature did not come from Mary. Yeah. And so the the divine nature comes directly from God. But Mary herself was seen to be perfect also. Perfect only, in, not in the sense he means perfect. Oh, okay. Morally sure, perfect. perfect right? no. So that would be the sense, that this is, sometimes we talk about like a perfect cup or a perfect circle or a perfect book or a perfect song. None of those things can actually be perfect on Descartes' view. Because all of them, by their nature, are limited and finite. Perfection would only apply to something that has at all perfection. So it's a little different in the way we ordinarily talk, for sure. Um, so Descartes would say Mary was maybe morally perfect, but not perfect in all respects. To be perfect in all respects, she would have to be like omnipotent and omniscient. Good questions. Anything else on on this end? We're going to talk more about God throughout this whole class. God was a subject that all these thinkers were interested in, in discussing, and um, well, there's a lot to be said about what these arguments, if they're any good or not. Um, a while back, you said um, infinite things cannot be added to, and that doesn't that's not right mathematically. I'm just wondering, like, is there a different, like, <coughs> the <coughs> definition of infinite we're using here? So, what what was I saying with regards to that? Like, like, um, like, um, you can't, I can't, this is a slide before this, sorry. Mm-hmm. <coughs> uh, I don't know. May I have been the one before this one, even. I don't know. Because, uh, I was talking about this idea that you couldn't... No, it was, it was that one. No. Yeah, this, uh... Wow. I don't know, never mind. <laughs> and this, this, something I was thinking about that might be related to this, that, you know, you can't, you can't arrive at this concept of, in, of infinity by joining together a bunch of finite things. If it comes back, let me know. Okay. I, you're right, I mean, I didn't, if I said something like that, I didn't mean to. Okay. Um, if... If anybody falls upon this idea again, I'm happy to go back over that. Um, here's our summary statement of the third meditation. So the whole meditation, we go through all this stuff about God, objective, and formal reality, substances, and modes, and you're like, what is the point? Let's just bring it all the way back to the beginning. The only way to ensure that my thoughts about general concepts are reliable is to know that my mind has been produced by a perfect being. So he's, 
from the beginning very concerned about how do I secure this general reasoning. And the only way that he can be confident of that is if he was produced by a perfect being. Since, if you grant it, the existence of God has been proven, um, uh, on, and it's been proven on the grounds that the only possible cause for my ideas must be an infinite perfect being. So this gives us now new confidence in our ability to reason and rely upon general concepts. So, whatever you want to say, sometimes when we think about God, we think of God for a variety of reasons, whether you believe in God or not. Descartes is invoking God for a very specific purpose, not to save his soul, not to give him comfort in an afterlife, not to um, help him be moral or virtuous. He needs God so that he can know 2 plus 3 equals 5. That's the role of God here. God is helping secure the fact that when he thinks about general concepts, he knows his mind is not leading him astray. There's not an evil demon deceiving him. There's a supremely perfect God. He would not allow that kind of deception to take place. Questions about Meditation 3. This is arguably the fastest anybody in the universe has ever covered it. Let's go ahead then and take a quick break here. So let's try, let's go ahead and keep it at about 10 minutes. So when our clock strikes 6.50, we will resume class.